Welcome to another episode of Your Life Simplified. I'm Scott Sturgeon, and today's episode, it's going to be a good one. We are going to talk all things wine. We're excited to get underway, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest. Kelly Trevethan is a Senior Wealth Advisor at Mariner Wealth Advisors, and maybe more importantly to this conversation, one of the founders of AXR Napa Valley Winery in Napa Valley. Kelly, thank you for, for taking the time to come on the show. My pleasure. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Well, we're so I think to kind of Kelly to get things started, it might be easier best for the listeners to frame the conversation. Do you mind sharing a little bit of your background and, and maybe even a little bit of kind of the passion for wine that, that you've kind of uh, that we've kind of discussed in the past? Sure. Well, the background as it relates to wine is uh, growing up as a young boy here in um, Northern California, my grandparents who immigrated over here from Italy um, ended up working. My grandfather worked in, in several of the wineries here. And so I always, as a child, was around winemaking. Um, my grandfather made his own wine, as a lot of Italians did, down in the basement. Wouldn't recommend drinking it, but uh, nonetheless, he seemed to like it. And he grew grapes um, here in uh, in the in the Northern California area as well. And so that was really kind of my first exposure to it. But I didn't get involved in terms of owning a winery until um, 2006, when we started a project called Alpha Omega in Rutherford, California, which is in the heart of Napa Valley. And so <clears throat> several of us started this project together. We found an amazing rock star winemaker that at the time, John Hofliger was at Newton, which was a, a very high end uh, Napa Valley Cabernet facility here. And so when they got purchased by Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, we were able to kind of uh, steal him away and start this new brand called Alpha Omega in 2006. And and that uh, grew to uh, a very well-respected luxury brand today. And then um, John and I started AXR Winery, which is our new project uh, about eight years ago. Um, and that is in the heart of St. Helena. It's a historical eight and a half acre estate that was built in 1883 one of uh, only nine ghost wineries, which means they were making wine before Prohibition, which was from 1919 to 1933. So it's um, it's our new baby. We're super excited and proud to uh, to share it with people. And uh, again, it's uh, a wonderful property right in the heart of uh, St. Helena, California. Very cool. I have to think that, you know, from your perspectives on wine production from childhood to Today, I mean, I, I just to guess that I have to think the industry has changed pretty drastically since then. And I know there's a lot of kind of processes that go into the ways that you, you know, that AXR produces wine. I think out of the gate, I'm just curious, in your mind, in very simple terms, what do you think makes a good wine? Well, I think what makes a good wine is the people who are sharing it together. Uh, I don't mean to sound corny, but, you know, wine with your lover or spouse or girlfriend or best friend or college roommate uh, versus having a, the same glass of wine with your worst enemy uh, will impact the uh, experience. Um, so I think it, it has a lot to do with your surroundings. But more importantly, of course, there is a big differentiator with the quality of wine, the source of the fruit how the um, terroir, um, which is kind of the, the, the environment, the land, you know, whether it's uh, vineyards that are up on a mountain hillside that, you know, are receiving sun on the latter part of the day versus on the ground floor in more, you know, gravel or, or loam type of, um, you know, ground that the vines are, are growing out of. Um, will impact the the flavor profiles of a wine. And so we do a lot of single vineyard Cabernets at AXR from some of the most well-respected vineyard sites in Napa, like the Tokelon Vineyard, which is probably what is most people consider the Holy Grail. It's received the most 100-point Robert Parker scores of any vineyard in Napa Valley. And so uh, I think that you know, all those things go into the experience of wine, but it really comes down to who you're sharing it with. And I think that that can, can make the experience, um, again, unbelievably positive. The wine obviously has to be good. And in Napa Valley, there's literally, you know, close to 500 wineries. So 
Um, getting good wine is not difficult to do, but you want to find the right environment, the right setting. Um, and of course, uh, what ends up happening is people do find their favorites. And Jean Hofliger, our winemaker, has 11 100-point scores, which is that perfect score that is um, given by some of the wine um, aficionados or critics, you would call them, Robert Parker and um, Galoni, and there's a whole host of them now that um, write publications. There's Wine Spectator, of course. But um, I think the answer to that question, Scott, is that it really comes down to uh, who you're enjoying the wine with, and that can make it um, absolutely a, a stunning experience. I'm interested to hear that answer. That is not what I immediately would have gone to. I think I go to what's the terroir? Well, what are the production means? Um, you know, how, what's, how big is the batch or, or how good is that year based on climate or quality of the grapes or what have you? It's, it makes total sense. I mean, you know, having a glass of wine on a sunny day, in my case, with, on the patio with my wife is, is great. And and the quality of the wine, I think, probably really plays into that. But but I I think you're exactly right. It's 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 a lot of who you're with. That's that's, that's a great answer. I I guess you know for listeners to really touch on a full spectrum of, you know, if you're just a beginner or you or you kind of drink a certain um, subset of wine that is maybe made in larger batches, all the way to maybe collectors or or those seeking more rare vintages or, or things like that. To to kind of start on that one end of the spectrum, if, if you're kind of a I guess you'd say like a passive wine drinker or, or you're just kind of getting started in, in looking at, at different kinds of wine and the wine that you like the most. Do you have kind of two or three, I guess, tips or pointers that you kind of recommend in, in kind of figuring out what it is that you really prefer? Well, I think experience obviously is, is the number one way to do that. A, a second approach, of course, is, um, you know, just being able to uh, to access information that there's plenty of, of wonderful information on wines from, you know, now there's apps like Vivino where you could literally take a picture of a wine bottle in a restaurant and it'll tell you everything about the terroir, the winemaker, um, how many cases were produced, you know, flavor profiles, tasting notes, you know, technology has obviously created some pretty cool ways for people to find out about wine and even buy it. I mean, I would tell you that I'm a <clears throat> I'm a total wine uh, junkie. Um, so from either reading the Wall Street Journal, Letty Teague's edition on the weekends, to you know even our local San Francisco paper here, they have a food and wine section on Sundays where the food and wine critics will say you know you need to try these wines. It's a South African Sauvignon Blanc, and you know and it's not necessarily expensive, but you know, it gives you the ability to try different things and find out what you really like. And what I recommend people do is, you know, don't get pigeonholed into just thinking that Napa Valley is the only place that you can find Cabernet. Um, yes, you can find amazing Cabernets and some of them sell for thousands of dollars a bottle, like, you know, Harland or Staglin or Rajo or, you know, some of the, the famous cult cabs that are out there. But you can find amazing wines um, as well you know, from Italy, we just traveled, um, you know, before the pandemic to Italy to celebrate my wife's birthday. And we went to the Amalfi Coast. And you know, I was sitting on this beautiful rock ledge where there was a restaurant. And I was having a glass of, you know, Italian Pinot Grigio with an eggplant Parmesan. And I was like, I could have died right there. And I would have, <laughs> there couldn't have been a better moment. The bottle probably might have cost $25, but it was probably the best glass of, you know, Pinot Grigio that I had in my life. And again, getting back to, it was the people I was with, it was the experience that I was in the middle of that made that wine taste like it was the best white wine I had ever had in my life. But I would say that utilize all those tools. I mean, look in your local papers. I'm sure there's, in most cities, there's a wine, you know, critic that will give you recommendations. And a lot of times they're, you know, sommeliers or they've got their, you know, W set, you know, level two or three. So they can obviously give you some amazing guidance, uh, but you will find that there's some terrific wines that, that are affordable. But I would say, you know, people really should branch out and try things from Argentina or from Italy or from Germany. You know, you have Rieslings, you have Tokai, which comes from Hungary, which is more of a late harvest or what they call a noble rot, which is where they leave the grapes on the vine well past harvest. The rains come, but tritis sets in, which is the form of, of mold, which they call noble rot. 
and it shrinks the grapes and it spikes their sugar content that produces these amazing dessert wines. A lot of the wineries in the Napa Valley will call it a late harvest, and it's a Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc that they leave on the vine into the rainy season, and that's where they develop these dessert wines. So try everything. There's just so many amazing opportunities. When my wife and I were traveling into Hungary, that was our first exposure to the Tokai region, which was heavily, heavily looked at as just a, a gem in this particular part of the world to, gra- to, to grow this, this particular fruit. And if you ever get a chance to try a Tokai wine or if you see it um, on a menu somewhere, please try it. It'll, it'll absolutely knock your socks off. But um, I, I would say the best thing to do is just really look at all these tools and try things and find out what your palate is attracted to because everybody's different. My wife and I have totally different approaches to wine. She likes this big, jammy, fruit forward, almost like you stuck your hand in a jar of, you know, blackberry preserves and put it in your mouth. And, you know, I like wines that are a little bit more balanced and might have a little bit more earthy notes to it because of where it was, where it was grown. But it just has more complexity to it, a little bit, what I would say, more layers to the wine versus my wife who just likes an absolute big Napa fruit bomb, which there's plenty of, you know, there's the Prisoner brand that came out that has become very, very popular. Whereas, you know, you could have bought that wine for, you know, $40 in the store and, and it's big, beautiful. You can pour it as your everyday wine or Frank Family is another wine from the Napa Valley that, you know, you'll find kind of everywhere on every wine list. And you just know it's going to be consistent. It's going to be big, beautiful, jammy, you know, typically what, you know, Napa has represented in the past. But that would be my recommendation is just look at all these sources and get a chance to try some of these wines. You can certainly do that with these apps now. Vivino, again, they just make it so easy. What a world we live in. I That's, that's so great. I, I The experience piece is really interesting. It's I mean, it kind of goes without saying that obviously the more different kinds of wine you can try and in different regions and different experiences for each of those, the better. You know, as I'm going, let's say I'm going through this process of trying different wines, whether they're different reds, different whites, whatever the case may be. As I'm going through the process, you know, let's say I'm just kind of a beginner or maybe an intermediate wine enthusiast. Do you have recommendations on the actual tasting or determining what tastes you prefer, if that that makes sense? Sure. Well, for me, you know, I did some training. So I I have my WSET2 um, certification, Wine Spirits Education Trust, which is out of the UK. Um, So it's a matter of, you know, that work, studying, uh, tasting literally hundreds of wines from different parts of the world and understanding from that, you know, where these wines were were being produced, what what the temperatures look like, the terroir of that particular region, what, whether again, it was in Italy, whether it was Argentina or Chile or France or California, Germany, et cetera. So uh, for me, it was learning more about those wines in an educational format, which allowed me then to have, I think, more appreciation for wines coming from all over the world. Um, and then, of course, when you get food mixed into it, it's a whole nother situation, right? I mean, there's wines that you can taste out of a glass by themselves where you're like, yeah, that's, you know, it's okay. And then all of a sudden, somebody puts it with a dish that a chef has made for you, and you taste the same wine after a bite of that food. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know, you hear angels singing. It's like, oh my goodness, that's just so expressive. And now I, I taste these flavors of, butterscotch or wheatgrass or lavender, whatever is meant to kind of be expressed in that wine can be very, very different when you pair it with food. And I think that that's something that's really fun to do too, is to get together a group of people, find wines that you can actually get pairing recommendations on in terms of dishes, and then experience that with food uh, and it, it, it's it's quite fun. I mean, we do it quite often at the winery. We do wine dinners where we'll bring in a famous chef from a local Napa restaurant, and ahead of time they'll pair the wines with the food with the help of our winemaker, and then it's just a, a culinary experience that is is really a lot of fun. We we try and do these wine dinners quite often. We actually do a lot of them in people's homes all over the country, where they'll have come to our property, fell in love with it, fell in love with the wines, and they'll say to us, hey. I've got 20 friends of mine. We're thinking about bringing a chef in from a local restaurant to the house 
and just have a group of our friends. Would you be willing to, you know, come and pour your wines and we'll pair them with the food? So those happen all over the country. Um, and they're a lot of fun because you get to kind of bring Napa Valley to, to them, whether they're in New York or Connecticut. Outstanding. I could certainly see the appeal. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks again for downloading this episode of Your Life Simplified, which is produced by Mariner Wealth Advisors. And at Mariner Wealth Advisors, we're here to serve as your advocate. We help people chart a course to reach their personal and financial goals so that they can have greater peace of mind that may lead to a more fulfilling life. We do this by always putting our clients first. Because as fiduciaries, we're required to provide guidance that's in the best interest of clients, not in the best interest of a company or shareholders or anyone else. So as you listen to this podcast and have questions about maybe your own financial situation or would simply like a second opinion or even you have an idea for a future podcast, please go ahead and email us at podcast at marinerwealthadvisors.com. If you found the information on this podcast valuable, please go ahead and share it with a friend or family member that you think might benefit from this information. And please don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. Kelly, switching gears, one of the things kind of on the maybe the more advanced end of the spectrum I wanted to touch on today was actual production of the wine. We had like a kind of a a prompt or kind of discussion, you and I beforehand, and I was fascinated on hearing the intricacies that AXR goes through to create the the bottles and, and, and casks of wine that you do versus maybe methods employed by, you know, larger producers that we probably see all over the country. Would you mind kind of touching on the different processes you employ and, and kind of what and, and how that impacts the final product? You know, I think that when you when you get into the high end Cabernets from Napa Valley, and especially when you talk about wines that can be, you know, literally in the hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars per bottle, it really comes down to how that production takes place. So so for us, everything is done by hand, right? So we don't harvest by machines. We we simply will have real people out in the vineyards, taking the fruit off the vine when it's time, then that'll come in. There'll be a destemmer that kind of shakes the berries loose, but then there'll be individuals on a conveyor belt that'll hand select the berries and they'll pull out stems or leaves or berries that aren't ripe. And that will then go into an open barrel top. We do things very differently at AXR. We we do 100% barrel fermented wine. So they're not spending time in stainless steel like they do at a lot of wineries and certainly the larger wineries. So it's it's more labor intensive. It's kind of what we call old world winemaking techniques. So the fruit, once it comes off, it's all, again, hand sorted into a barrel. Then what we do is we put dry ice uh, pellets into that open barrel that's filled with uh, the berries. And what that does is it keeps the temperature from spiking to where a natural fermentation process takes place. So why we do that is because our winemaker believes that the longer you can have the grape skins in contact with the oak without a fermentation process actually occurring, the smoother, more velvety, more elegant mouthfeel that wine will have at an early age. Whereas if you take a lot of Napa Valley wines, you know, you'll open up a cab that was in two, you know, made in 2017 or 18, and you know you'll have this massive tannin explosion and this kind of gritty sandpapery taste on the back of your tongue, which is really the tannins from the fruit. And they're not soft, they're not elegant, they're they're harsh still because that wine needs to lay down for a while. So our winemaker kind of revolutionized open barrel top fermentation and cold soak fermentation, which is what it's called when you put the dry ice in. And it just creates a wine that is so approachable at an early age. And there's a reason behind it. We just didn't decide that this was a good idea for no reason. What we found is that the largest wine buying population currently, which probably is no surprise to anybody, are the millennials. You're talking about almost 54% of the wines are being purchased by that age group. Well, that's not a patient group of people, as you guys know. They want instant gratification. They're on their phone all the time. There's, you know... Again, Facebooking, they're you know doing everything that they want instant gratification on. And so we did the same approach with wine. So we used cold soak fermentation and open barrel top fermentation to make sure those wines were approachable. So if you ordered a 2018, 
you would go, oh my goodness, this wine tastes like it's been laid down for 10 years. It's, it's smooth, it's elegant, the tannin structure is not harsh or dramatic. And so that's what our approach is. And a lot of wineries are now following suit and doing the same thing, especially the high-end you know, Cabernet um, shops throughout you know, the Napa Valley. And so again, from fruit going into the barrel, dry ice going into the barrel, it stays that way for a period of a few days. Uh, what happens is uh, the staff will do what are called punch downs. So it's a, it's a little device that has like a, a metal circle on the end with a long handle and you'll push down the fruit inside and kind of keep it moist. And then it keep adding dry ice pellets until the winemaker believes it's time to let that dry ice completely evaporate and let the natural fermentation process happen. So then what happens is those open barrels get moved into what's called a hot room where there's a gas furnace and the temperature is up, you know, 110 degrees or something like that. And now these open barrel tops have like a shower cap on top um, to protect against um, exposure or contaminants. But now the natural fermentation within the barrel stays, right? So they continue to do punch downs. And then what ends up happening is they drain all that juice out, put it into another barrel, and then that sits for, again, the maturation process. And during that time frame, what will happen is the staff will go in and they'll lift up the rubber, what's called a bung, which is obviously it's a, a plug that goes into the top of the or side of the barrel. And they'll go in and, and do what's called stirring of the leaves. So they'll have a device that goes inside that barrel and basically mixes with a little wand all of the yeast and the settling that happens from the fruit that's in that uh, barrel. And so that'll continue to happen. And then of course the winemaker will go in there, they'll will taste the wines, they will go through at some point in time a, a blending where they'll, you know, possibly add Merlot, Petit Bordeaux, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, you know, any of the Bordeaux varietals that may go in there to finish the wine. And again, just so you know, in order for it to be a varietal, you have to have 75% or more of that particular fruit in that bottle. So if there's only 60% Cabernet, it cannot be called a Cabernet Sauvignon. It has to be called a red wine or a table wine or a proprietary red blend. But you'll typically see a lot of winemakers use those other varietals in their blend, uh, but it doesn't have to be on the bottle. So again, if, as long as it has 75% cab, it, it can only say Cabernet and only has to say Cabernet. But then of course you do see a lot of blends now. I think it's really popular to see red blends coming out because it softens. You know, Cabernet for the most part is known as kind of a big, powerful uh, varietal. And uh, it, it tends to have bigger tannins and it tends to be a, a wine that's a little bit more complex. And I think what has happened is, you know, with the Prisoner, and with a number of other red blends that have come out that have been really popular, I think the millennials specifically do like to see uh, a different wine than just Cabernet Sauvignon. But of course, Cab is king in the Napa Valley. It's the most expensive. It's, you know, fruit can range anywhere from $5,000 a ton to the Tokalon Vineyard, which is, you know, $35,000 a ton. And they have a waiting list to buy the fruit. So if tomorrow, we went to Andy Bexover, who's the largest owner of vineyard land in California and happens to own the Tokalon Vineyard. If we said to him, hey, Andy, we're not really sure that we need your fruit anymore. Literally, there would be three seconds he'd go, no problem, see you later, thanks, click. There'd be a list of 50 other wineries that want our fruit and they would pay that number, which could be five, six times what they'd pay for other Cabernet in Napa Valley. So. There's a lot of single vineyard designated wines now that you're seeing out there that are super popular. We do six of them, meaning that it's 100% cab, barrel fermented, but they come from just one vineyard. And they're vineyards that are very well respected, like Tokalon, Pritchard Hill, Denali, Sleeping Lady, uh, Artelade. We have an estate cab that we do from AXR, which is the V Madrone Estate. Um, so that's a really popular trend, but single vineyard Cabernets are going to continue to get a lot of interest. Um, but I think in general, there's a, a big, big approach for us of making great wines. And it's very much driven by what I like to say, old world winemaking. So it's the cold soak fermentation. It's the open barrel top fermentation. It's 
all that very labor intensive work that goes into the wines. And that's why the wines tend to be more pricey. You know, our wines range from, you know, maybe $90 to, um, you know, $280 a bottle. Um, and so those aren't cheap wines by any stretch of the imagination. And you need to make sure that, of course, you know, those wines are absolutely stunning if people are going to spend that kind of money for them. Sure. So Kelly, what, I mean, from stem to bottle, what is the all in time to, to execute on that process? Is it, are we talking days or, or weeks? Is there kind of a time frame there? It's a great question. Uh, well, again, if you're looking at Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay, you know, it could be a, a six to, to 12 or 18 month time frame from start to finish before you've got, a, you know, a bottled product. When you're looking at red wines uh, specifically, it's usually, uh, you know, a two and a half to, to three and a half t- year time frame from start to finish um, when those wines are bottled and released. And so um, I would say that, again, on the short end, you know, you can do, you know, rosés and Sauvignon Blancs and have those, you know, available in, in six months from the time you pick the grapes to the time that they're in bottle and can be um, enjoyed. But for, for red wines, you're typically looking at, you know, two and a half to, to three and a half years from start to finish. The, this is all fascinating. I, I had no idea. The, the 75% number was, I had no idea. Um, I think you just pick a bottle off the shelf and you assume that it's all one kind of grape when, when in reality it, it may not be. And, and it's, what's also interesting, I think, and, and two is to differentiate, you, you briefly mentioned price points. And, and I think that's a good <clears throat> kind of a allusion back to the first comment you made, which is, you know, AXR produces what you would categorize as exceptional wines at maybe a higher price point, whereas maybe larger companies will produce l- larger quantities of wine at a much lower price point. But at, at the end of the day, maybe part of it, the process of enjoying that wine um, is just as important as the process of how it's created. So so I, I think they're, they're great points all around and, and certainly really interesting to hear the intricacies of kind of that more artisanal approach, if you will, um, versus maybe a, a much, you know, mass distribution format, certainly no right or wrong answer either way, but a very different product um, on, on both ends. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, I think people need to look at price and not really get caught up on it. You know, I, I, I would say that I was a guilty of that same thing where you go into a restaurant, and you open the wine list and you go, oh, well, this $300 bottle of wine's got to be better than this $30 bottle of wine. And that's ridiculous. In fact, Stanford did a study where they basically were looking at, you know, prices of wine and, and doing a, an actual blind tasting, right? So you would take a $500 bottle of Tokelon Cabernet, and there could have been a $40 bottle of, you know, Prisoner Red Blend and other wines in between. And people could be told that the Prisoner was the $500 wine, and the Tokalon was the $40 wine, and people would just say, oh, oh yeah, well, that one's definitely better when they knew the prices, right? But if you were to completely do a blind taste, which we've done a bunch of times, in fact, it's been a fun event that we do with clients sometimes where we'll bring in like seven, eight clients, we'll sit down, we'll do a complete blind tasting just for fun, we'll pair it with you know charcuterie and cheeses and things, and just to kind of have a, a great experience and usually there's a huge surprise in the room at the end because somebody picked the cheapest wine to be the actual favorite. And so I think it's it's never about price. It's really about the experience, where you're having the wine. And, and again, don't get me wrong, Napa Valley handcrafted wines, there's definitely a difference, you know, between mass produced wines that are being harvested by machines and people don't even touch the process. It's just a massive machine from the beginning to the end. There's going to be a big difference in terms of the quality of the wine, um, but you'll be surprised. What I like to tell people is you're in a restaurant and they have a sommelier, ask them to come to your table. Tell them to recommend something that is probably something you would never try and just get their expertise and you would be surprised nine times out of 10 that you will find that they don't pick the most expensive wine to recommend. They actually pick something that they chose because they had an experience when they went to Germany or when they went to Italy or when they went to France and they found this small little mom and pop vineyard that made this amazing wine and it wasn't super expensive. And so I always like to say to the sommelier in the restaurant, hey, recommend, here's what I'm eating. Tell me what I should order, bring it out. And I've never been disappointed that, that 
is something I'd recommend everybody do is really lean on the sommelier or the wine buyer in the restaurant and, and have them make recommendations, especially with what you're going to eat. And it'll tend to be an amazing experience you won't regret. That's outstanding. Kelly, this is all really great tips and recommendations, and, and I so appreciate it. I feel like we could probably talk about this uh, the entirety of the remainder of the day. <clears throat> Obviously, we're. I want to just take a moment to thank you so much for, for taking the time to sit down with us. One of the questions we always we tend to ask our guests when they come on is, what's the biggest financial lesson you've ever learned? I think I, I'm kind of curious if I kind of flip that on its head or make it very specific to our topic. What do you think is the biggest maybe wine lesson you've ever learned or, or the biggest takeaway you would impart to our listeners about wine in general? Well, I think it's wine, but it's also the experience. You know, I, I have been a big fan of Walt Disney and I've read every book that's been written about him. And, you know, the whole concept, if you've read any of his books are, he always wanted to create a themed client experience, right? Or a visitor experience or guest experience. And I've always gone in that same approach with creating these two wineries and specifically AXR because it is an old estate pre-prohibition. It used to be a speakeasy. There are 10 cottages on the property at one point in time. And so, you know, when we bring people to the property, it's a themed experience that all of our guests have. We walk them through the history of what's happened on this property, of course, they're getting glasses of wine as they're walking through the property. And so everything we do is part of an experience that we want people to kind of walk away with. The wines are just in addition, right? The wines have to be good. We're in Napa Valley. You, can, you can't be a B player and survive in Napa Valley. You have to just make sure that everybody that comes to your property has an amazing experience. So I keep going back to that Walt Disney analogy because he's done it so well. I mean, a man that created something back in the 50s that today is mesmerizing children and adults still tells you that he obviously had the magic sauce that people really, really were thriving for. And that's what we try and do at, at AXR is just make sure people become ambassadors for our estate and that they come back from Napa to Kansas City and they say, oh my goodness, you have to go see this place. It's unbelievable. And if you ever go to Napa, I want to introduce you to them and you have to make this one of the stops on your tour. Um, and so that's really, you know, what I would say is a, is a big takeaway. Uh, experience is so critical and it's, and it's so key. You're exactly right. Whether it's wine or it's, you know, in our case, wealth management, it's at the end of the day, it's that experience that really makes the difference. And Kelly, I just want to thank you again so much for taking the time to sit down with us. And, and again, obviously for, for imparting all the knowledge uh, you know, that you've acquired over so many years and with your experience. Uh, so thank you again. Happy to be here and uh, look forward to having people come out. And if they ever do uh, head this way, AXR Napa Valley is uh, is definitely a place where we would love to to host them and, and take great care of them. Definitely. Well, thank you again. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in today. As always, if you have feedback, comments, questions, we would love uh, to hear that from you. You're welcome to reach out to us at podcasts at marinerwealthadvisors.com. Thank you for tuning in. Mariner Wealth Advisors or MWA is an SEC registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in the state of Kansas. Registration of an investment advisor does not imply a certain level of skill or training. MWA is in compliance with the current notice filing requirements imposed upon registered investment advisors by those states in which MWA maintains clients. MWA may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Any subsequent direct communication by MWA with a prospective client shall be conducted by a representative that is either registered or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from registration in the state where the prospective client resides. For additional information about MWA, including fees and services, please contact MWA or refer to the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website at www.advisorinfo.sec.gov. Please read the disclosure statement carefully before you invest or send money.